Now let's talk about free space management. This is another important aspect of disk management, uh, which keeps track of and allocates free space. Uh, and one simple approach is to use a bit vector or bitmap in which each bit represents a disk block. So a bit vector or bitmap, it will have n, uh, it will be used to indicate whether blocks are free or occupied. So over here we see a bit vector or bitmap that contains n bits starting from 0th bit to n minus 1th bit. And at each bit, you could have an entry of 0 or 1. If it is 0, that indicates that that particular block is occupied. And if that bit is 1, that indicates that that block is free. So by having a very simple uh, bit sequence, we can keep track of the blocks that are uh, free versus blocks that are occupied. So for example, in the diagram that is shown, the zeroth block is occupied, the first block is occupied, the second block is occupied. Actually, the first free block is uh, block number four, which is the fifth block. Um, so we would need a number of bits in the bit vector would equal the number of blocks that you have in your memory. Um, and this is essentially to keep a free space list um, for all the available blocks, or we can do this also for clusters, which are groups of blocks. So an interesting thing that we can calculate uh, by using this bit vector, and that this calculation needs to happen uh, very often done by the operating system, is to keep track of the first free block. And the calculation is pretty simple. All we do is find out the number of bits per word uh, which is eight, uh, the, the, a group of eight bits is called a word. So number of bits per word is eight multiplied by the number of zero value words. A zero valued word has all eight bits in it to be zero. Um, so we know, we, we try to find out the number of the zero value words um, and we add the offset of the first one bit. So let's uh, work through this particular example and see what each of these uh, values turn out to be. Um, the, the offset of the first one bit, uh, CPU has instructions to return the offset within a word of the first one bit. So we get that particular offset by executing a CPU instruction. So uh, if we scan this bitmap sequentially from the first non-zero word, uh, let's see, the first group of eight bits, what are they? Uh, zero, 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 one, one, and some uh, other bits. So uh, the, if we pad it with another two bits, we have a non-zero word because we have two ones in there. So after the non-zero word is found, we look for the first one bit. Now this is going to be the uh, bit position four or the fifth bit of the non-zero word. So the offset in this case would be five. So that means that in this equation, we would find the first free block by taking eight, which is the number of bits per word, multiplying by zero because we didn't have any zero valued word while we were doing the scanning. Our uh, zeroth word was itself a non-zero uh, valued word. Um, so eight times zero plus the offset, which was five. So zero plus five, we get five. So fifth uh, bit, which indicates block four is going to be your first free block. Now, as the, um, the, the number of blocks increase, your bitmaps will also require additional space. So if we go through this example where we have uh, a block size of 4 KB, which is 2 raised to 12 bytes. So this is one block size. And the total disk size is 1 terabyte, for example, 2 raised to 40. So how many blocks would we be able to fit in that disk? Well, that can be simply calculated by dividing the disk size by block size. So we get 2 raised to 28 as the number of blocks 
and we would need each bit to indicate whether the block is occupied or free. So that means in our bitmap or bit vector, we would need two raised to 28 bits, which is essentially 32 megabytes. And if we are able to use clusters of four blocks, then we divide that 32 MB by four and we get eight MB of memory. So all it, the, the downside here is that we need eight megabytes of memory just to store the bitmap for a hard disk that is of one terabyte size. That is after using uh, clusters of floor blocks. Uh, but the, the good thing about uh, this bit vector algorithm that it is simple and it is easy to con get contiguous files, which means that if you were searching for contiguous blocks of memory that are free, we could run uh, fast algorithms that exist for quickly finding those contiguous blocks of a given size. All we have to do is run a search over that bitmap to find continuous ones string of ones and depending on uh, the size that we are interested in we would look for the corresponding uh, sequence of continuous ones so it's fairly uh, easy to to search so that's one way of managing uh, free space let's take a look at another uh, alternate here so a linked list can also be used to keep track of all free blocks Traversing the list and or, or finding a contiguous block of a given size is not easy. But fortunately, uh, these uh, operations are not frequently needed. Generally, the system just adds and removes single blocks from the beginning of the list. Now, as you can see to the picture on the right, we have a free space list head that is essentially a pointer to a block which is grayed out, indicating that block two is free. When we go to block two, it will have a pointer to the next free block, which is block three, then block three will have a pointer to the next free block, which is block four and so on. So that's going to be a linked list of all the uh, free blocks, hence the, term, hence the name linked free space list. So by, by doing this approach, um, we are going to ha waste no space because even though there are uh, some uh, grayed boxes and white boxes indicating that they are occupied, because we are maintaining a linked list, we are not going to waste any space even though there is a fragmentation of the disk going on. But we are going to pay a price in terms of cost of traversing the list. Um, so that is go not going to be too easy. Um, and it is also not easy to get contiguous space easily because now the, the everything is fragmented and to search for a given size of contiguous blocks, that is not going to be easy because may, we are maintaining things in the form of a linked list. Um, but very important question here is what if the pointer to the free space list is lost? So the, the pointer that points to the first free block itself is lost. What do we do? Well what we can do is something called as garbage collection, which searches the entire directory uh, structure to determine which blocks are already allocated to jobs. The remaining unallocated blocks can be relinked as the free space list. So garbage collection can be done to sort of re rebuild this uh, free space list, even if we lose the pointer to the, to the head of the list. Managing a free space can also be done in two other ways. One is grouping and the other is counting. Grouping is essentially a modification of the linked list uh, to store address of the next n minus one free blocks. So all we do is we store the, uh, the address of the n next n minus one free blocks in the first free block. So there is a pointer to the first free block where the first free block holds the address of the next n minus one free blocks. Plus it also includes the pointer to the next block that contains free block pointers like this one. So by we are essentially grouping the lists together and putting all the addresses of the linked list into one block. 
and we also need to add a pointer to the next block that contains similar information. So that's grouping. Uh, we could also do counting. So because the space is frequently contiguously used in freed, with contiguous allocation or extents or clustering, we, what we can do is we can keep the address of the first free block and count how many free blocks follow that. So free face list then has entries containing the addresses and the count. So we could point to the first free block and then say, okay, after that, contiguously, we have 10 free blocks uh, right here. So by essentially implementing counting, we can do a free space management. Now let's talk about efficiency and performance. So efficiency, we talk about how uh, how are we doing in terms of allocating uh, disk space to files and performance, we are essentially interested in uh, latency. So how are we doing on response times? So efficiency depends on the following criteria. So disk allocation and directory algorithms, whether we are using linear search, whether you are using hash tables, um, what type of data is kept in files directory entries are we going to do pre-allocation or as needed allocation of metadata structures uh, or inodes for Unix? Uh, do we have data structures that are of fixed size or are we going to ensure that they can change in size, vary in size? Um, so all those aspects will uh, uh, be will any efficiency will depend on all those aspects. Now coming to the performance, which is going to be in terms of latency, we are going to take a look at uh, the, the, where is the data present. So keeping data and the metadata close together is going to improve performance. Uh, disk controllers generally include onboard caching. Uh, when a seek is requested, the heads are moved into place and then an entire track is read starting from whatever sector is currently under the heads. Uh, this reduces latency because the, the later on the requested sector is returned and the unrequested portion of the track is cached in the disk's electronics. Uh, some operating systems cache disk blocks they expect to need again in a buffer cache. So buffer cache separates sections of main memory for popular blocks. So if, are, if there are blocks in the memory, uh, in, the, in the disk that we are uh, continuously accessing, those are popular. So we keep them in buffer cache so as to uh, reduce the time it takes for us to access the secondary hard disk. Uh, we can use free behind and read ahead techniques to optimize this sequential access. So free behind uh, frees up a page as soon as the next page in the file is requested with the assumption that we are now done with the old page and won't need it again for a long time. And read ahead technique reads the requested page and several subsequent pages at the same time with the assumption that those pages will be needed in, will, uh, be needed in the near future. So by using these two techniques, we can optimize uh, sequential access. So over here, we are seeing a picture which has uh, a file system at the very bottom here. Uh, so to do a file IO operation, how, uh, how is the data going to move between the files and the IO devices? So one way to do this is through uh, IO operations using read and write system calls that uh, move data to and from a buffer cache and the data can then move to the file system to complete the file IO. Or we could have a memory mapped IO instead of using read and write system calls. Memory mapped file IO allows the file input output operations to be treated as routine memory access by mapping a disk block to a page in memory. This is going to simplify and speed up the file access by driving file input output operations through memory rather than the read and write system calls that are uh, slow because we need to use the kernel space, which means a trap for the OS. So by using memory mapped IO or by using read write, uh, we can have a unified buffer cache. So a buffer cache essentially has a cache for doing the IO or it has a page cache for memory mapped IO. We are combining them into a unified buffer cache in, in this case. Now let's talk about what happens when we have a system crash, for example. 
So we can uh, do the following things. We can do consistency checking, we can do a backup and restore, or we could do uh, a technique called journaling. So the, 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 the storing of certain data structures, for example, date directories and uh, inodes in Unix um, in memory and the caching of disk operations can of course speed up performance. But what happens in the result of a system crash? All volatile memory structures are lost and the information stored on the hard drive may be left in an inconsistent state. So we would need a consistency checker, such as a FSCK in Unix or CheckDisk or ScanDisk in Windows, which is often run at boot time or mount time, uh, particularly if a file system was not uh, uh, closed down uh, properly. So this can uh, uh, be done to try to fix the inconsistencies, uh, but obviously this is gonna make things slow and sometimes it might not be possible to fix the inconsistency so it could fail. The, and the other strategy, the next strategy, uh, is to do a backup and restore. So uh, the system programs uh, exist in operating systems that can backup data from disk to another storage device, maybe a magnetic tape or magnetic disk or optical drive or, or, uh, or a server. And we could, if lost, we could recover that lost file or disk by restoring the data from the backup. So that's another strategy that the operating systems can apply. Another one is called journaling file system, which is a log-based transaction-oriented file system. This essentially borrows techniques from uh, developed, uh, uh, that were developed for uh, databases, guaranteeing that any given transaction either completes successfully or can be rolled back to a safe state before the transaction commenced. Um, all the transactions are written to a log. A transaction is considered committed once it is written to the log sequentially, sometimes to separate the device or a section of the disk. However, the file system may not yet be updated. By maintaining these transactions, what we are ensuring is a faster recovery from crash um, and this also removes the chance of inconsistencies of metadata because all of those are being maintained in a transition log. If the file system crashes, all the remaining transactions in the log must still be performed. So uh, it's not like we are losing uh, that metadata information about the transition logs. So journaling file systems are uh, another option to uh, uh, do a system crash recovery. All right, with this, uh, I believe you guys can uh, work on the class activity.